Thank you, Dervla. Um, and once again, I'll, I'll, I'll welcome um, the several hundred people who are here just now um, to Living With Loss. Uh, Irish Hospice Foundation has been running these events online since 2020, when a lot of the world went online. Um, we are very grateful to have the support and the sponsorship indeed of Fanagan's Funeral Directors then to help us in our work. Uh, so thank you to them. A lot of you are coming here today and you probably wouldn't almost prefer not to be coming because mostly what we find is people come to grief talks because they've experienced grief. I'm going to just let you know what's coming up, how we run these evenings so that you can know what to expect. So we're going to have a couple of talks. We'll hear a talk on grief and grieving and indeed on coping with grief. We'll hear a talk on children and grief and how to speak with children. We'll also have a talk on really describing to you the various supports that are out there in our communities. Not wanting to talk at you all the time, we are also putting in some readings and reflections. Um, so those will be um, parsed through the evening. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. And again, many of you, when you were registering for this event, you put in a question and we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Where we weren't able to answer questions or themes, we will put together some resources and some written responses that we'll email along with the recording of this evening. Uh, as I said at the beginning, you're maybe sitting watching this alone, but part of what we want to stress is that you're not actually alone in that there are at least some supports and services to reach out to. We are really happy today to have uh, a number of them present with us. There are 17 of the different services that I'll be inviting to, you know, just to go on display in, in a moment. Um, but I suppose I want to also highlight that those supports and services acknowledge that grief happens from all different causes. It can happen at any point in a person's life. A person may be bereaved through the death of a, an infant, through a stillbirth. They could be bereaved later in life. They could be bereaved through an illness or through a sudden death or indeed a violent death. And all of these supports try to take into account um, the range of ways in which we meet bereavement. To start our evening, um, each of the services is going to appear on the screen, again, uh, by virtue of my colleague Dervla's magic uh, buttons on this computer, and they're going to light a candle. So they'll appear with a lit candle. And the point really of the candle is really to give us uh, a little ray of light, a little ray of maybe hope in are grieving. It's, it's a dark time. And light, for as long as we can remember, has been a symbol of hope. Uh, so I'm going to invite those services now to turn on their cameras and to show their candle if they can. Look at that lovely array of people who are there. And I'm going to uh, introduce them to you. Um, we have Linda from A Little Lifetime, um, who, who work with people where a baby has died at or close to birth. We have Leanne from Anamkara, and Anamkara works with uh, parents and siblings when a child has died. Colleen is here from Bernardo's, and Bernardo's uh, Children's Bereavement Service. Shirley is here from Bethany Bereavement Support, and Bethany is a community support group uh, available around the country. We have Elaine from CRY, and CRY supports people who've been bereaved through sudden cardiac death. We've Caroline from Embrace Farm, 
Um, and again, acknowledging the very specific situation for people who've lost someone through a, a farm accident. We have Carmel from Felicon, the stillbirth and neonatal service. And we have Jennifer from First Light and First Light work and support uh, people who've lost a child through a sudden death. We have Anne, I think, from Our Lady's Hospice. And Arlene from HUG. And HUG is a peer support group for uh, people who have been bereaved through suicide. We have Maura here from the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network, working to support people who try to support children who find themselves in that situation. And Donna from the Irish Road Victims Association. Welcome, Donna. We have Teresa from Purple House in Bray, and Purple House works with people who've been bereaved through cancer. And we have Anne from Rainbows, again, supporting children throughout the country who have met bereavement or separation um, to another cause. Joan is here, I think, from St. Francis Hospice on the north side of Dublin. Helen from Support After Homicide. And last but not least, Leanne from Taurus Lakela in Kildare. Again, another community support group that works with people who've met bereavement through all different types of circumstances. Thank you all so much for the work you do year in, year out, and for being there. My colleague, Amanda, later on in this session is going to um, leave some further details for how you can contact these groups. Thank you, everybody. So we might now take a moment um, to turn off the cameras. Thank you very much. And we're going to start with the talks I mentioned. And our first speaker is Catherine Tierney. And Catherine is going to pop on her camera now and it'll go to speaker view. Catherine is our clinical lead at Irish Hospice Foundation. She's a psychotherapist. And she works obviously with people who've experienced bereavement and she supports our bereavement support line. And Catherine is going to just share with you some of her experiences and understanding about grief. Thank well, you, Catherine. Thanks, Orla. I'm just gonna get Durbla to turn on my video because it's it's turned off for some reason. I think it's turned off by the host. So I just let Durbla do her, do her magic. Lovely. That's it. That should work. OK. And just to mention the lovely Dorota, who uh, was representing there the bereavement support line, which is a lovely service that I'll that I'll come back to. So I'm just going to share screen and uh, hope that this this will work. Um, let me see now. Um, so I'm going to take, take you through and thank you, Orla, for, for all of the introductions. I'm going to take you through um, some slides on coping with grief and loss, um, some slides that I hope help you understand grief and loss a little better. But above all, by the end of it, I hope that there's some things you can take away that really will help you um, with what you're going through at the moment with the losses. And there may be multiple losses um, that you're experiencing. So. Um, I hope these will be will be useful to you. Now, um, just on the, the first slide there, these are just some of the, I suppose, key messages. Um, just some simple things. So, for example, in the in the early phases of, of, of grief, it's called the acute phase, but it's very, very normal to experience intense emotions. There's a there's a sense of there's sort of a madness of emotion. There can be really intense emotions that can 
uh, that can completely dominate you. And, and in terms of that emotional intensity, you might find that cognitively you're all over the place in terms of making decisions or trying to even decide uh, what you're doing in a day. So that that intensity is very, very normal in that first phase, that acute phase. And um, one of our key messages in the Irish Hospice Foundation is there's no one right way to grieve. So that's that's going to be a theme throughout uh, this evening. There's no right way to grieve. And the, the, the little image there is really to say that, you know, every person's grief is unique. It's as unique as your fingerprint. And it's an amazing thing. You know, we all have an absolutely unique fingerprint and every person's grief is unique. And if you think about that, uh, your grief might be different to your sibling's grief, might be different to grief in your in your wider family. And some of that might be to do with with with, you know, other griefs that you've had, maybe unprocessed griefs. It might be to do with other stressors that are going on at the time. So just that will become uh, maybe a little bit more obvious as we go along. But just to give yourself that understanding that your your journey through grief is your own and it's unique. And even if it's different to others, um, that have experienced the same bereavement, that's OK. That's very normal. Um, that sense of compassion, really one of the key messages throughout this um, is to really take yourself easy, take yourself gently. Um, Self-compassion is terribly important because grief is exhausting. Um, it's exhausting on so many levels, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, it's a process, so it takes as long as it takes and just to really go easy on yourself and self-care is, is so, so important as well. One of the things, if you look at that, um, that table, is you'll see the amazing range of ways that grief can impact us. Um, so if you think about the physical, often people have difficulties with sleep. Uh, it's, it's absolutely exhausting. So exhaustion is a key, key thing that people talk about. Um, sometimes people can find that they have headaches, they can find that they don't feel like eating, they might lose weight. Um, anxiety surprises people. I don't know if you ever read that lovely book by C.S. Lewis, um, where he talks about nobody ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. And that really resonates with many people, the anxiety and the panic that can come, especially in that acute phase, if you've lost maybe the person that's closest to you. Um, so just to really be aware of that and to, to take yourself gently and to lean into whatever offers of support you might get, especially in that acute phase. Um, I would say to you as we're, as we're moving through all of these, if you're really struggling with eating and sleeping and that's going on for some time, especially if you live on your own, link in with your GP. That's just a little, I suppose, a little health warning just to mind yourself because exhaustion um, and sleep issues and also that lack of motivation of eating of eating at all is just is just a, a warning sign so link in with your GP if that's you at the moment just to make sure you get the support that you need um, if you think about um, the cognitive piece of that yearning for the person who who's died the pining for the person who's died that's very normal in the in the initial phase and um, the psychological dis despair um, you can have anger, you can have sadness, um, you can have guilt and remorse, and we might talk about that later, but that that often comes up as a theme. People might feel feel guilty or they all the shoulds that can that can rush in. So again, that sense of self-compassion, like no shoulds, there's no I should have done this and I should have done that, because we all do the best we can. Uh, and love is 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 measured out in 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 action it's not a it's love is the the love that you've you've given to that person over all of those years it's not measured out in the one moment when you think you should have done something um sometimes what people do when they're grieving is they lean into things that aren't very helpful to them for example you know drinking too much or um drugs maybe that they would have they would have used before so just to really be aware of that if you find yourself leaning into um, what you feel is sort of a, a, an avoidance, but something that helps you to avoid the grief. Really be aware of that. And if you can lean back out, because that really won't won't help you or won't help you to get through it. Um, sometimes people have a crisis of faith. And again, getting back to that uh, C.S. Lewis piece, he really had a crisis of faith. Many, many people do when they wonder how did this happen to my family, my loved one. So just to know again that that can be very, very normal. Um, and loneliness and withdrawal, people can really isolate themselves. And if there's one message in, in that sort of 
realm is to really make sure that you don't isolate yourself. It's, it's an instinct that we have, but sometimes what we want to do, which is to withdraw, isn't what we really need. So just make sure you keep, you keep your supports close. I've said this, but just to, to say it once again, grief is so, so exhausting. And it's exhausting if you imagine because it affects us on so many of those different levels. It affects us physically, it affects us psychologically, how we behave, even our, 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 our existential questions um, our social questions, our, 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 cognit our cognition is, is even affected. Um, so just to take yourself easy, because it's it is exhausting. If people offer um, to, you know, walk the dog, put the bins out and um, drop over meals or invite you over for a bite to eat. Um, if there are people that you feel comfortable with, do say yes. You know, take offers of help if, if they're given. Um, this is just a, a good thing to know that sometimes people think, look, I was doing fine. And all of a sudden I felt completely overwhelmed by grief. So just to be aware that you can have a grief burst, you can be overwhelmed by grief walking around Tesco and you suddenly you didn't expect it. But maybe something happened. There was some you bumped into somebody or there was something, you know, playing over the speaker or some piece of music or something. So just to, to take yourself very easy that a grief burst can happen. Um, I mean, even years after, I mean, I'm reminded I, I, I was completely overwhelmed by um, a bereavement that I'd had. And it was 30 years later, I mean, 30 years later. So it was it was quite some time ago. And I was completely, completely flooded by grief in a place where I was back to, um, if you like, the, the place where a lot of that um, uh, a lot of that experience in my life had had happened. So just to say that you could be triggered by a song, you could be triggered by a smell, a scent, a place, a person. Um, you know that old poem of every old man I see. You know there can be that triggering, or or you can go to reach for the phone to call your mother or your father or your best friend, and suddenly you're just reminded again. Um, so just to take yourself very easy. So that's all in the acute phase, but grief first can happen, as I say, thirty years on. Uh, sometimes a lot of our losses happened way, way back and they were never processed. So to, to really take yourself, take yourself so handy. And um, one of the things that we're always saying is grief doesn't happen in stages. And, and that, that sense of, you know, um, that it's not linear. So that's a key message. It, there's not a sequence. It's not tidy. In fact, it's it's very, very messy. Uh, there is no right way or right amount of time. So just to always remember that. Um, Kubler-Ross uh, did a, a, a lot of great work. She was a sort of a, a pioneer in her day, way, way back in the, in the world of grieving. But her research, which is what introduced the five stages, was for people who were dying. So just remember that her research was about people who were terminally ill and dying. It wasn't um, people who were bereaved. So it, it's not the universal map. So it's not the map that we follow. And it's not even the map that is helpful to follow. Um, it may be helpful for people who are terminally ill. It may map to, to their experience. So that it's not linear. There's no um, sort of particular timeline. You all grieve in your own way. And it's a, it's more akin to your thumbprint. You'll, you'll, you'll grieve in your own way. There is not, no right or wrong way. Um, and the right hand side sort of sums it up. It's really a messy, confusing um and especially with that anxiety and panic that can that can hit some people in the acute phase, it can be quite frightening. So just it's it's messy. It's certainly not linear and it's not in any of that that flow and that we were sort of um, that was suggested maybe by that stage theory. Um, again, this is something that's that's worth saying is some grief isn't obvious. So there's a there's a term and it, it's a fancy term, but you know that some some grief but some losses are hidden and that's the key thing some losses are hidden maybe because they're not seen as worthy of grief and you think about um one of the lovely services we offer is the bereavement support line and sometimes we get people phoning us because their pet has died and sometimes you know family or friends or the wider community doesn't understand the depth of that loss and if you think about a pet you know a, a a pet is always with you you know they're they're like a constancy if you think of somebody who lives alone they might see more of their pet than they do of a family member or even their wider circle. So that the depth of the love for that for that pet is is the depth of the grief. So that's that's one example. But there are so many more examples. Um, sometimes the losses that are hidden are are things around in infertility, 
a miscarriage, uh, if somebody's had a termination, if somebody's having a, um, a hidden affair and, and that person dies, um, sometimes the grief is disenfranchised because the cause of the death is, sti is stigmatized and that can still be around suicide. Or for example, in, in criminal gangs, if, the, if there's a death there or a, or a murder or a tit for tat, there can some, sometimes be a sense of maybe a societally that that, that death isn't as worthy of, of grief as let's say a death in your own family. So just to be aware of that, that many losses are hidden. Um, one, one of those hidden losses is, uh, is a non-death loss. And, and Dr. Pauline Boss, she did a lot of research in this area. Um, so she talks about this, this idea of, of the ambiguity of, of loss, some of these non-death losses, where somebody's physically absent, but psychologically present, or physically present and psychologically absent. And if you think about the, the physically absent, if you think about any of the missing people, you know, any of those people that have gone missing, um, I'm thinking of Annie Mc McCarrick is one of them, but there's many, many more where, where the body wasn't found or a drowning where the body isn't found. So that that terrible, um, that terrible difficulty for the family where there's no ritual, there's no body, there's no funeral. So they have to do this mourning where they have no um, they have no way of of ritually acknowledging that's that person's uh, presence in their life and, and to acknowledge that. But, but physically absent and psychologically present can also be, for some of you, you might be a grandparent whose adult children are married with children in New Zealand or Australia, and just the loss of them, the loss of, of contact, you might have virtual contact, you might have the, the Zoom or the FaceTime, but it's not the same. There isn't that contact, um, especially if you're living on your own here, there's a loneliness in that where you don't have that contact with them. Um, but you'll have many other examples too. And then the goodbye without leaving where somebody's physically present, but psychologically absent. And again, if you think about um, somebody with an acquired brain injury, um, if you think about dementia, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a care of somebody with dementia or your loved one has Alzheimer's, um, or if you're living with somebody who's in addiction, active in addiction, that they're present, but absent. Um, and really the, 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 the loss and the grieving um, that that can be a part of 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 all of that. Um, if you think about an acquired brain injury, they're present, but they're but they're absent. And sometimes, boss, she talked about that as being a stranger in the house. You know, maybe living with someone who isn't the person that you knew. They're they're present but absent. So just the the paradox of that. Um, anticipatory loss again. You may be someone who is struggling with a terminal illness. Uh, you might have had a life-changing diagnosis or someone that you love and there might have been an accident that has completely changed your life or the life of your family um, you might be facing up into retirement or redundancy so these are all anticipatory losses and again we need to just be compassionate with ourselves and know that we we can grieve those losses and be supported in in those losses and um, this came up a little on the on the q a so just to be so aware that grief doesn't just dissipate, it doesn't disappear, it doesn't, you know, it's that that old idea that if you ignored it long enough, it might go away, it doesn't. So if you're somebody who's in their 60s, 70s or 80s and you never dealt with maybe a loss, even in your childhood, it might be a parent, it might be that beloved pet, it might be a grandparent who meant everything to you, it might be a sibling loss. A lot of these are hidden losses that actually we carry with us. We carry with us for years and years and years. And it's never, never too late to get the support to deal with those losses. Um, you know, that the bereavement support line is there as an emotional support. If you wanted to ring and talk about maybe that person that you haven't talked about in 30, 40, 50 years or a baby that died, you know, maybe early on in your marriage, you're in your 70s or 80s now and you really want to talk about that child or baby that you had so many years ago because you never had permission maybe societally to, to do grieving at that time. So just to remember that, that there is there are supports there and there's also counselling supports. It's never too late to grieve any of the losses that we have. Um, contemporary models. So that, that sounds a bit fancy, but just to say that we know so much more about how we grieve and what helps us to grieve. And, and, and uh, Lois Tonkin talked about, you know, the grief doesn't go away. It doesn't disappear. That over time, the process of grieving is that we grow around our grief. So you see in the, the little picture there, 
that your grief stays the same, but the intensity of the grief eases and that we grow our, our life around the grief that, you know, we still have had that loss. We might have had that loss last year or a few years ago or 50 years ago. And we we carry it around with us that that loved one is still loved by us. Uh, but we grow our lives and the, and the goal of grieving is not to shrink our grief, but to grow our life in relation to our grief. And it is a process and you can't rush it. And um, this is a key message. So I think if, if you took nothing else away from from these slides is to remember that we need to dip in and out of grief. Uh, grief isn't a, a passive thing. It's not just something that happens to us to get through the process, to get ourselves to the point where we can live with our grief and integrate it into our lives. We have to have this idea of dipping into our grief and then dipping into the action side of life. So getting on with life, paying the bills, maybe getting the kids to school. Um, so that, that's the action piece. And the left hand side is maybe that idea of making a date with your grief. Don't avoid it. We need to we need to dip in and dip out. That's the that's the healthy way to get through your your coping with grief. And if you do too much of the left, you can get stuck there. If you do too much of the right, you might avoid your grief altogether and you'll just carry it around like a, like a dead weight. Um, this idea can be helpful, too, that we, we sometimes need to dose our grief. And, and that key message, the grief is exhausting. You cannot grieve all the time. It's just not the way we're built. And, and Mother Nature has built us this way. We're not meant to grieve all the time. You dip in, you dip out. Um, and even the dipping in might be taken out of a, a photo album going through photos just where you're somewhere that's comfortable and you're sitting somewhere comfortably take the time but it might just be half an hour an hour it's not a day looking at photos you know and sort of finding finding yourself drowning in it you dip in you dose your grief you dip in and you dip out um continuing bonds i put in this photo because i i have lots of things in my kitchen that belong to my mother and it's it's sometimes i i look at them and i think my god you know she probably bought them I don't know, 50 years ago or some ridiculous amount of time. But I think fondly of her whenever I use them. Sometimes people have jewellery belonging to their granny or their godmother or their mother or their dad. They might have something belonging to my dad. And then one of my brothers has a, a ring belonging to my dad. Um, sometimes people connect to their loved one through um, honouring them, through the rituals, you know, the funeral is such an honouring thing and the remembering is such an honouring thing and the telling stories remembers them. If you think about that word and you split it, it's like remembering, putting that person back in, in, in the family in their rightful place. And to remember that key message of, you know, death ends a life, but not a relationship. You're still completely connected to the person who loved. You'll never forget them for as long as you hold a breath. You're never going to forget the person who has died. They're part of you. Um, and if you have grandchildren or great grandchildren, you know, you can see sometimes the traits um, that, you know, that he's just like his granddad or he walks just like his dad or, you know, there's so many things that that carry on even through through the genes. So so we we, we stay connected through place or people, through talking, through honoring. And um, so just to remember that, that there's always the connection and um, meaning making. So that sense of, you know, Sometimes what people will do is they'll say, you know, this was a devastating loss, but I'm going to make sure that it matters. I'm going to make sense of this, this suffering by um, uh, continue, you know, continuing to remember them in our family. Or um, there was a, a lovely quote from um, one of uh, Cora from Anamkara, and I know we've Anamkara on the on the Zoom tonight. But, you know, there was a lovely recent quote where, where this, this parent um, whose son died talked about, yes, the child we loved and cared for isn't here anymore. But we also have to honor the life that we have while honoring their life as well. It's learning how to do that. There are no quick fixes and it takes time. So that sense that there has been suffering, but that somehow you're going to turn that suffering into something meaningful. Sometimes people have... Um, set up a charity. Um, if you think of the Laura Lynn Foundation, if you think of Rosabelle's Rooms, which is a great um, charity also uh, for people who've, who've lost a child. So something around making sense of the loss, what's their legacy? And um, what did I learn from them? What would they want for me? And what have I learned about myself through this loss? And this key message of both and, that, that one of the key messages of grieving is that you, you eventually learn to accommodate both and 
that there's the, the pain of the loss, but also that it's okay to be, to take pleasure in things, to have a, times of joy, to have times of, of um, enjoyment with friends or family or just going for a walk or out walking your dog, that both end um, because the, that's, that's what life is like. There's, there's love and pain, there's sadness and joy. So yes, grief can get stuck. And that's come up in the questions too. Um, it's, it's, grief can get stuck for many reasons, but sometimes it's because people have um, unhelpful beliefs, you know, that sense of a distorted belief, but that sense of grief is my only tie to this person. And, and it's a very Irish thing maybe, but that sense of if I grieve less, it might mean that I love them less. Um, and that isn't true. You know, that sense of continuing bonds, they're still part of you and your the, the love that you had for them and the love that they have had for you still remains the same. Um, sometimes um, there's there's a sense of, of the attachment style being very relevant here. So sometimes for people who have insecure attachment, um, what they can do is it's almost like they're still trying to hold on to the, the person who's died um, and they're, they're, that resistance to moving on can be problematic. So one of the things I just have a little, sorry, now let me just go back here. Um, is that a, just a lovely, lovely picture in the middle? Um, one of the things that I would say to you is if you're someone who feels actually, I think I am stuck in my grief. I, I suppose I want to say two things. One is, will you remember that, that it's not a passive thing grieving? You actually have to take baby steps and you have to take baby steps dipping into the grief and then dipping into life, dipping into the grief and dipping into life. And, and if you're really struggling with that oscillation, with the dipping and dipping out, seek help. You know, there's if you if you have a medical card, if you're on disability, you can get free counselling through your GP. But there's so many ways to get help. Ring the bereavement support line if you want signposting. But it, it, it's about courage and it's about a little baby step. So I'd really encourage you if you if you feel you're stuck to take baby steps. Um, one of the I mentioned this, but the bereavement support line is there for you. It's Monday to Friday. It's 10 o'clock to one o'clock. It's free. Please do call us. What we offer is a wonderful um, emotional support. It's not counselling. But if you need signposting to counselling supports or any of these fantastic organisations that are on tonight, um, we'll signpost you to them and give you the information you need. And remember, if you need counselling, there's lots of free counselling and we can advise you on that through the EAP, medical card, health insurance. So just um, give us a call if you want information about that. There's lots of low cost options and there's lots of private options. Um, really, I'm sure I've run over time. So anyway, self-care, make sure that you look after yourself. Um, this is a great quote, you know, almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. So just take yourself very easy and be a, a compassionate with yourself. There's lots of free resources and we'll talk, uh, talk, uh, talk about them in a little while. But um, dip in and dip out. Grief is exhausting. And that's my end message. Really take yourself easy. That's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Catherine. Indeed. Thank you. Um, and I um, I will remember the baby steps and particularly your your mother's dishes and the fact that death ends a life, not a relationship. So so we can stay connected. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass you on now to our colleague at Irish Hospice Foundation, Kieran Stewart. And Kieran has chosen um, a reading for us. Uh, and he's, he's, he'll explain a little bit about it. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks a lot, Orla. Um, so for context for what I'm about to read, um, Nick Cave is an Australian singer-songwriter who sung Arthur died at 15 years of age in tragic circumstances in 2015. He lost his second son, Jethro, in 2022 and has been very open at the resulting grief from both losses, including an album and associated film, which he has described as a testament to an artist trying to find his way through the darkness. The piece I'm about to read has been released as a spoken word track called Letter to Cynthia, but I will read from the original source, The Red Hand Files. This is an online fan forum whereby fans can post questions to which Nick responds. In 2018, a lady called Cynthia posed the following question. I've experienced the death of my father, my sister and my first love in the past few years. 
and I feel that I have communication with them, mostly through dreams. They are helping me. Are you and Susie feeling that your son Arthur is with you and communicating in some way? And this is the response that she received. Dear Cynthia, this is a very beautiful question and I am grateful that you have asked it. It seems to me that if we love, we grieve. That's the deal. That's the pact. Grief and love are forever intertwined. Grief is the terrible reminder of the depths of our love. And life, like love, grief is non-negotiable. There is a vastness to grief that overwhelms our minuscule selves. We are tiny trembling clusters of atoms subsumed within grief's awesome presence. It occupies the core of our being and extends through our fingers to the limits of the universe. Within that swirling gyre, all manner of madness exists, ghosts and spirits and dream visitations and everything else that we in our anguish will into existence. These are precious gifts that are as valid and as real as we need them to be. They are the spirit guides that lead us out of the darkness. I feel the presence of my son all around, but he may not be there. I hear him talk to me, parent me, guide me, though he may not be there. He visits Susie in her sleep regularly, speaks to her, comforts her, but he may not be there. Dread grief trails bright phantoms in its wake. These spirits are ideas essentially. They are our stunned imaginations reawakening after the calamity. Like ideas, these spirits speak of possibility. Follow your ideas, because on the other side of the idea is change and growth and redemption. Create your spirits, call to them, will them alive, speak to them. It is their impossible and ghostly hands that draw us back to the world from which we were jettisoned. Better now and unmanageably changed. With love, Nick. Thank you so much, Kieran. That deserves just a moment. If you love, you grieve. And follow your ideas and follow your spirits. Thank you so much. Mostly um, at this hour of the evening, it's probably adults that we have around the around the computer. Um, but we're very conscious that most adults have a child somewhere in their life. So we've asked Maura Keating, who's the national coordinator for Irish Childhood Bereavement Network, which we're privileged to host here at Irish Hospice Foundation, to talk from her experience as to how might you talk with and support children in the face of grief. Thank you so much, Maura. Thanks, Orla. So as Orla said, we're, most people that have signed on tonight for this webinar are here mainly because you're looking for some support or some community of support around your own grief as an adult. But many of you um, have children in your lives. Um, have they might be your grandchildren, they might be your nieces and nephews, or they might be your own children, or they might even be children that you work with, you might be a teacher that works with children. So we thought we'd we just spend a little bit of time tonight um sharing some information about children's grief and why it's important to understand and recognize the differences and the similarities um in the way that uh, we grieve as both as adults and children. And as Catherine said earlier, you know, our grief is such a unique experience to us and children are no different. Um, I suppose the main difference is the way in which children might express their grief. Children come to grief often. It's a first, you know, in their childhood, if they've experienced the death of a loved one, it's, going, it's likely to be their first experience of this. So it's very different and, and new. And it shakes their sense of safety. Um, 
because we know that especially young children live in a bubble of safety. We protect them from everything. It's our job as adults to protect them and to mind them. So when a death happens in a family, it does shake that sense of safety. And children find it very difficult to express the emotions they're feeling through words or language. So often it'll come out in their behavior and their actions. In the same way as it comes out in our um, body and in our thinking as adults, children will have the same set of emotions muddling around and racing around in their heads, but they don't necessarily know how to make sense of it or to even understand uh, what's normal and what's not. So do expect that you'll see physical and emotional reactions, and they might be a whole range of different things at different times. There's also a strong prob probability that children, you'll see there'll be delayed behavior, or de delayed response, because it's a big thing for children to absorb. It's a big thing to, to sink in the enormity of what's happened um, for children. So therefore, sometimes it takes longer for them to process it and they need a fair amount of um, time uh, for to accept what has happened. And also, you know, we'll see, it's natural to see some regression. I mean, we, we look at regression in children's developmental milestones sometimes and we say, well, you know, that's understandable because just the whole enormity of grief takes up so much energy that if they're older, they're not going to be able to concentrate in school the way they used to. If they're very young, they may regress a little bit in their milestones. But again, they are all understandable and normal things because their body, their their mind, their whole emotional being is trying to process these changes that have happened in their life. So don't assume that they understand um, because as, as it's hard enough for us as adults to, to understand what we're going through when we're grieving. Um, it's extremely hard for children um, to understand it because they've no experience of this. So grief is very, um, grief for children is really very uh, influenced by their age or their developmental stage. So up to a certain point in a child's life, uh, we know that as they're growing, the brain is still growing, the body is still growing, they're developing. So the enormity of death and the reality of death, that death is final, that all living things die and that death is final and people can't come back after they've died. Up to a certain point in childhood, children don't fully understand that. Their brain isn't developed enough, they're emotionally not aware and understand that this happens. And that's why you will see up to a certain point, children will be maybe have what we call searching behaviour or ask questions, maybe say something in a very factual way about the person that has died. And then in the same sentence say, but I think they'll be back for my birthday, won't they? Or, you know, so there's that's because they don't fully understand that um, the permanency of death. And that carries through for children right into and some right into middle childhood. Now, again, we talk about age and developmental stage because not every five year old is the same. Not every seven year old is the same. Some children, their brain develops and their their experiences will have them understanding this a little bit earlier, some a bit later, but usually around middle childhood and in, in, a, in the early years of primary school, they start to learn, develop a more mature understanding of death. But that doesn't necessarily mean they want to accept what's happened or they want to believe that it's for real they, because they live also in the world of magical thinking at that age. So they often will fantasize that, you know, it wasn't, didn't really happen or daddy's just away somewhere, um, but he will be back and things like that. Also, it's common for them to believe because they believe the world revolves around them often at that age is that something that they did completely unrelated um, could have caused the death. Um, but as I said, but as they move into and certainly into preteen years, um, they they have that understanding, that more mature concept of death and the understanding of death. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they want to accept it. And sometimes teenagers will say, well, you know, if I don't think about it, if I don't, if I avoid the house, 
um, I can pretend it didn't really happen. So they still might kind of live in it, want to believe that it hasn't happened and don't want to accept it. And we also know that some children who are developmentally delayed or who are neurodiverse may never come to that understanding, that uh, uh, that mature understanding of death. So we, it, it's important to to get a sense of where you're, where the children that you're talking to are at in their thinking and in their understanding. And then to also look at the way in which they might grieve. And we have this lovely image from a book written by Julie Stokes called You Will Be OK, called The Grief Swing. And a bit like Catherine was saying earlier, the way uh, as adults, we kind of s oscillate from loss and rebuilding. Children do the same. They, they dip in and out of their grief. They very seldom sit in um, the land of loss. Uh, the river of grief flows through their life. It's there all the time. But they really are, are drawn uh, to be diverted from their grief, to be distracted by normal things, by play, by doing, by actions, by being with their friends, by, by, by you know, that sort of hardwired ability children have to play. So as adults, when we see children playing and being distracted and not expressing emotions around the grief, often we'll say, well, they seem OK. They don't seem to be bothered by it. They seem fine. They're out playing or they're carrying on with their activities and they seem OK. But similar to adults, there will be grief bursts. There will be times where they will have to sit with the land of loss because it doesn't it doesn't it isn't removed from them when they they're rebuilding their life. It just is distracted. And when they sit in the land of loss, when they hold that grief, that's when it'll come out in different ways in behavior, in emotions. Often it's at the end of the day when the distractions of play and all the activities are over and they're settling down to bed that those emotions will bubble up. That can be a really challenging time for us as parents because that's when we're often exhausted ourselves and we need time just to cope with our own grief. But that's when those things will bubble up for children as well. So this is a normal way in which children um, deal with their grief and respond to their grief. So what sort of things would be helpful? So getting a sense of their understanding of death based on their age is really important. So check in with them where they're at, what they understand, regardless of their age. And if you have different children in the same family, you know, that's a separate conversation you'll have with all of them. And that gives you a sense of then where where you need to explain things and how you need to explain them. But talking openly and using really clear and concrete language is helpful. The language you use might sound harsh if you're being very concrete, but actually children think in that very concrete, literal way. So be very clear and explain what dead means if they're very young and they don't understand that dead means that somebody can't come back. So sometimes you'll have to be explain those obvious things to them. But even with older children, explain to them what has happened, the experience that the person has gone through and the reason why they have died. But breaking the information down at a level that they can understand and not overwhelming them with too much because they can only absorb a certain amount at a certain time. So that means you're going to have to, it's not going to be a once-off conversation. You're going to have to repeat the information, breaking it down and providing it with that information gives them lots of reassurance. It unravels any confusion they might have their head. And it's the confusion that causes the anxiety and the worries. Give them the space to express their emotions regardless. And it might be a lot of children, they'll all, it's the fingerprint theory again. They're all going to be different. They'll express it differently in different ways and at different times in their, in their growth. But help them build the memories, help them have that sense of they can continue the love, they can continue the memories and do things that are still keep that loved one uh, important in their lives. Children are often very worried that they're going to forget the, the person um, that they love so much. So keeping that those memories alive are really important and answer their questions. I know sometimes they ask really challenging questions. And even if you don't have the answer, be honest with them, acknowledge the question and, and let them know that you'll do your best to either find out or 
that it's okay to ask it even if you don't have the answer. The family is really important in children's life for, for how they're going to be supported in their grief. An awful lot of people think every child that's been bereaved needs to have counselling. That's really not the case. Sometimes there is a need for some support outside of the family. But really, even if you do get some support outside the family, the family is going to be where they're going to get their day to day emotional support. So the more informed you are and the more help you get with your own grief, the better the outcomes for the children. School is a hugely important part of a child's community. So don't be afraid to link in with the schools. We have a website with a lot of resources for families and for schools and other professionals that you can tap in and get practical information on how to support children, how to answer questions and how to explain things. And you can also contact us directly through the website um, with any particular questions you have. And we're more than happy to schedule a call with you and uh, talk through things. So I'll leave it there for now and I'll be available later on the panel for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maura. Um, I don't know how you managed to pack that, so much into such flu. a short time. <laughs> yeah, and really, you know, to help us understand how children think is vital. Um, and I loved what you said towards the end. We got to look after ourselves if we're going to look after them. So thank you very much indeed. I'm going to introduce you then to our final speaker before the panel, and that's Amanda Roberts. And Amanda's our Bereavement Development Manager at Irish Hospice Foundation. And I suppose she's going to focus on, well, what's out there to help and to maybe to give you some direction and signposting as to what's available around the country. So thank you very much, Amanda. Thanks, Amelia Norla. Um, so the, for the next couple of minutes, I just wanted to give you a sense of kind of what supports are out there. If you do feel that you need some sort of support outside your family and friends, I'm just going to share a couple of slides um, just around some of the organisations and how you can contact them. Okay. So I suppose it's just to give you a sense of what's out there. And it, I suppose you get the sense from this evening that the services are a really important part of um, our events and the, um, the Living With Loss evening. And I'm not gonna go through detail with each of the different services, but what I will do is give you a sense of what's out there. And at the end of the evening, we'll have some slides that will give you a bit more information about the supports. And then afterwards, we're going to email you out more information, the phone numbers or websites of each of the organizations and how you can contact them. So just before I go into the service, I just to let you know what, what is bereavement care? And what do we mean by care after bereavement? I suppose, like Catherine said already, we all have needs after the death of someone close. And a lot of us get that support from the people that are around us, our family, our friends, our work colleagues and our neighbours. Sometimes even our clubs, men's sheds, our choir or our fitness classes that we go to every week. And what a lot of the support that we get from people, it's the acknowledgement from people that the death has happened. Sometimes we might get some information around kind of welfare payments or how to register a death. And also practical supports from the people around us. Someone might offer to do, especially in the in early weeks and uh, days and weeks of bereavement, someone might offer to do the grocery shopping for us or pick up the children from school because we just can't face going to the school yet and, and, and talking to people. The other type of support we get from people around us is the emotional support. So it might be the cup of tea and the chat with someone or a walk with someone, or even sometimes people go to do something to escape or to get out of their head a little bit, maybe go to the cinema with someone just to escape that kind of like what Catherine was saying earlier, that dosage piece. And for some reason, uh, for, for sorry, for a variety of reasons, some of us would need some additional support outside our kind of social network. And that might be, just some space to go uh, get an opportunity to go through the loss with someone that we don't know. It might be someone like a bereavement volunteer, or we might want to share our experience with someone else who has had a similar experience. So that might be in a bereavement support group. And then a small number of people would and may experience more complex needs and they may benefit uh, going to uh, accessing more of a counselling service. So maybe more professional kind of service. And how we, our services are grouped or how bereavement support services are grouped in Ireland, we have 
services that are specific to bereavement. And some of those services can be based around how the person died. So some services are uh, around if a person died through suicide, farm accident, homicide, cancer or chronic illness. And then other services are actually um, based around the relationship we have to the, uh, to the person. So a service could be based around pregnancy loss or after the death of a child or the death of a partner. And then also we have non uh, bereavement specific service that can actually be really helpful sometimes. For example, citizens information service would be a general information service, but they have a really good booklet around kind of bereavement and the practical things around the entitlements and um, other kind of uh, um, uh, how to register a death. So all those kind of practical things that we need to know after a death. And just before I kind of introduce you to some of the services that are particularly here tonight, all the services have a wide range of kind of supports and services within their organization. Some might have all of these and some might just have some of them. So nearly all of the organization will have some form of information around the bereavement. Sometimes it's on their website, a booklet, a leaflet. They actually might even have an event, an information event around the particular bereavement uh, they support. They also might have remembrance services. Some have support groups and some have one-to-one -one kind of support uh, with a bereavement volunteer. Some people, some organizations have phone line or helplines, and some organizations might have a counseling support service. The first group of services I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction to are the organizations that support people after they experience a pregnancy loss or when a baby dies in and around the time of birth. Uh, time of birth. And so we have Linda from A Little Lifetime that you've seen earlier, and then Karma from Failacon. And one of the things just, I suppose, that might be a little bit um, different around Failacon is one particular support they have is a Bereaved Dads football team. So Tony from Failacon uh, manages kind of a, where dads get to come together. Some of them don't actually just want to sit in a room and have a conversation, but there's a football team that they get to kind of engage and, and um, kind of spend some time together. Our next group of services around uh, supporting bereaved parents, and we have Leanne from uh, Anam Cara here earlier on, and they uh, provide bereaved parents after the death of a child of any age. So it could be a child who's 40 or 50, and that bereaved parent could come and access this support. The other organization in this space is uh, Jennifer from First Light uh, was here, and they're actually more of a counseling services. and They offer support for bereaved parents of a child who died who was under 18. The other sort of services we have are the cancer support centres and the hospices. And we have um, Teresa from Purple House and Joan from St. Francis Hospice and Anne from our ladies hospice here. And particularly around hospices, these are for support for uh, relatives who um, have patients who died under the care of the hospice. So again, if your person died under the care of the hospice, hospice contact the hospice and see what kind of supports they have available to you. Other organisations are uh, grouped around supporting people who have bereaved through suicide or those who are bereaved through accident or sudden death. And we have Kathleen from Pieta here tonight and a Arlene from Pogue and then Leanne from Teresa Kayla. One of the organisations uh, here tonight is Caroline from Embrace Farm. And this particular organisation are for those who um, experience sudden death or through accident or traumatic death um, it's the, the support in that farm community. And one of the interesting things that this organization provide is particular around kind of farm communities. There might be a particular financial issues around kind of the farm and those sort of um, um, aspects of the death. And they would have supports and people who would specialize in that area that they could um, liaise with and have contact with and the help with support. We also have Donna from the Irish Road Victims Association. And one of the things that uh, Irish Road Victims Association have is this really good booklet that gives you those practical things that come along with a, a, a death through a road traffic collision. So things around post-mortem or inquest or guard investigation. So they have a really good booklet around those practical pieces as well. I suppose other organisations as well, you have Helen from um, uh, Support After Homicide and also Sh Shirley from from Bethany and they're actually community-based services and if you log on to their website they have organizations all around the country and this is the case for a lot of the or other organizations if you log on or phone in you can find out what sort of supports that they have in your local area 
And one of the things as well as around supports for bereaved children, and I know um, Maura alluded to this earlier, and one of the organisations, or a lot of these organisations, they will actually have supports and information for the guardians or the parents of the child, and then some of the organisations will actually have supports for the children themselves. So again, you log into their or phone in their organisation, and they'll be able to let you know what kind of supports that they offer. And just coming towards the end now, just to let you know, I know um, Catherine already introduced you to the bereaved support line, as was Jackie and Rita, you'll meet in a couple of minutes, are some of the volunteers from that uh, support line. And this again is a confidential space where people can speak about their experience and ask questions. And importantly, like Catherine said, this uh, support line can actually signpost you to all of these different organizations around the country. And I suppose just, I suppose, before we kind of finish, so one of the questions you might have uh, yourself is, look, if, I, if I, I do feel I need some additional support, what do I do? And uh, where do I start? And I suppose it's if one of these organisations, uh, maybe your bereaved parent and you might um, feel Adam Cara might be or Force Light or Felicon, contact the organisation, pick up the phone or look up their website and get a sense uh, if you think this organisation's for you. Maybe you don't know what you need or you're not sure if you need anything. That's where the bereavement support line can come um, into play. You can phone them up and just kind of get an opportunity to talk about it and explore and maybe see, look, if it's something you want to explore and get a little bit of more support outside your family and friends. The support line can give you a bit of a, a direction or a signpost to what's available in your area. And then finally, I just I took a picture of all the organisations that we had at the start. And I suppose it's just the supports. If you do feel that you need some support outside of family and friends, the information that you have here around the supports, it might be something that you avail of now. It might be something that you might take up a little bit later on down the road. Or you might know of someone that you think, do you know what, I actually think they might need the support. And you can send that information on to them. And I suppose just to note that it can be, I suppose, the first step is the hardest but just to know that all these faces are at the end of a website or an email or a phone call that if you do want to explore and maybe possibly um look to get some support outside the family and friends there are just pick up the call or pick up the phone or, or contact them through a uh, true email and um, thanks a million orla Thank you so much, Amanda. And I think that's a vital end message that there is a warm presence at the end of any reach out that, that a person makes to, to those services. Um, and again, thank you to them all for, for, for the amazing work that they do. We're, we're going to now come to the section of the evening where we have our question and answer panel. And I'm going to introduce you to Jackie and to Rita, who are joining our panel, and reintroduce you to Catherine and to Maura. So Dervla is arranging for, for all of these people to be seen. Um, so a really big wel welcome to, to Rita and to Jackie, um, both of whom work on the bereavement support line and voluntarily share their experience and expertise in supporting people. So thank you both for doing that. And thank you both for being here this evening. And thanks for returning, Catherine and Maura. We had a huge number of questions and what we've done is try to team them. So we're going to just follow a couple of teams um, and we'll see where we can get in terms of throwing some light on the issues that people had. And the first question that I have, it's from somebody and they said, does it ever get any easier to live with the pain? Will it always be like this? So somebody who's in the depths of it. Uh, I don't know, is that the sort of thing you might hear on the support line, Rita or Jackie? Would you like to, to start with that? Yes, um, I, I, I think it's, you know, a really good question. It's something you hear uh, again and again and again. Um, yeah, uh, uh, callers will call in um, and feel quite frightened actually by the intensity of their feelings you know it's it's frightening it's overwhelming uh, and there is that fear factor that it's always going to be like this you know that would be my experience anyway mm. uh, and sometimes just the reassurance 
you know, to know that you know th this is natural, a very natural response. You know that over time, generally, the intensity of feelings soften, yeah, soften, and get, and, mm. and get a little easier. And sometimes just that reassurance is enough. Mm. Also, I think it's worth mentioning that callers, because sometimes people don't fully realize, you know, we'd have repeat callers. So it's not a sort of a one time thing. And, you know, that callers are welcome to call as, as often as they feel they need to. I think it's mm -hmm. important to find mm -hmm. that out too. Mm -hmm. So am I to take from that, that that you might hear that somebody who was in such pain at one time might call back maybe months later and, and, and describe what you're talking about. The feelings had softened a little bit. Yeah. OK. OK. Rita, anything you wanted to add to that? I suppose for me, it's it's listening to where the person is at. Um, and even for them to to have that conversation with you, to they kind of hear themselves where they're at and it kind of gives them a little bit of clarity in it. But I suppose in terms of, of that, be, will it ever get better? I would always take the line to, to kind of just talk to them a little bit about the normal grieving process and the normality of that sense of being completely overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Catherine spoke about it earlier, earlier. you know, it is, it is a, an awful place to be and that sense of loss and just being completely at sea physically, mentally, psychologically, every aspect of your life and the exhaustion that Catherine spoke about. So even just to kind of have that, that little bit of education around the normal grieving process, mm -hmm. it reassures people that they're not going mad, they're not losing their mind. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, you're not minimizing where they're at. But grief and loss is part of life and we're built to sustain it. And, you know, that's not dismissing where anyone is at, but people sometimes need that reassurance that it will get better, you know, that it will improve. And I often talk, I often say to, to callers, it's like walking along the beach. You don't realise that the tide is coming in until you get so far down that you turn around and look back and then you see the tide has come in. That when you're taking the step and getting through each day, you're struggling and you think it's unbearable. But when you take a breather, and that breather could be ringing the helpline and having a conversation with a stranger, and you suddenly realise, well, I did go shopping this week. I did get the kids to school twice this week. And, and that way they're seeing that while it feels like it's not moving, it is actually. Hmm. And the very act of talking about it organizes your thoughts and experiences and helps you look at them. Uh, I, I love what you, you both said, uh, Jack, you said it's frightening and Rita, you said it can be overwhelming. So to normalize that and it totally right echoed what, what Catherine said. Did you have anything to add, Catherine, or more from the children's perspective? No, I love that. I think, mm. I think, my goodness, the experience in these two women and the and the callers that you know that arc of the call because we have seen the progression, and as as Rita says, you know, people even hearing themselves and mm. and acknowledging as they as they as they have witnessed or heard, gosh, you know, I have, I have taken steps. I have, I can see the light. I can see chinks of as Jackie mm. said. You know that intensity is. Is, I love softening. Isn't that such a beautiful yes. happy word? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that's, you can see that. So there's, there's great richness in, in what they've both said. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the next question is, is talking about when things are really bad, what can I do? So again, any practical tips for, for when somebody is really in the throes of grief, what can they do? Get up, get up in the morning to start with, and and that is an achievement in itself, isn't it? If if they're able to, um, do the ordinary, do again baby steps, um, and and sort of allow themselves the time to to see the clink. Uh, Catherine used the word the clink of light in it, you know. And there will be again, there will be some days that you won't put your foot out of the bed, and and that's okay too you know, depending on where you are at it. So again, it's to, it's to kind of, and if somebody rings in on that terribly bad day, they've made the phone call and yeah. celebrate and encourage them that that has been a huge, huge mm -hmm. step to make that phone call. 
and, and to pick up the phone on the next day that they feel is a terribly bad day as well, or if not to the helpline, to a friend, to somebody. And again, you know, reach out, you know, to, to the natural supports that are there, as well as coming to the likes of ourselves. But um, mm-hmm. And again, the, the bad day will come, but the next day will be better. I think a lot of parents as well often say to us that, um, you know, and they'll often ring us after a child has had a very big outburst and been very upset and it's been a really emotional roller coaster in the house and they get very overwhelmed, the parent, because they feel like, oh, you know, I, I tried to talk to them I tried, and then mm-hmm. it, it opened a can of worms and then the whole house was upset and they, they're they left reeling. Yeah. Um. And I think, you know, that we're often afraid of those emotions. And certainly, as I said earlier, for children, sometimes it's very difficult for them to to get those emotions out and they'll often bubble up and then come out in the big burst. But actually, the ability to even get that emotion out as a child to get in a safe space surrounded by family, you know, to let them have that moment where they're getting all those feelings and emotions out, give them the hugs, reassure them you know, create the safety around them. That's enough then often for them to go off and then go back to their Mm. everyday activities. Now, as a parent, that leaves you shaken like a leaf because you're like, you've absorbed all that. You're terrified and you're thinking, oh my God, you know, if that happens again. But actually, it's not the worst thing that's happened. The worst thing has already happened, actually. The person you love has died. Having a big emotional outburst is not the worst thing. It's actually a release sometimes, and especially for children because they can't get the words out. So don't be afraid of it. Mm. A very good tip. Don't be afraid of it. Yeah. I wonder, could I just add there as well about, uh, I know Catherine mentioned it earlier, but, you know, there really is this, can be this fixed idea with callers that, you know, grief is linear and it can be, I was doing so well there for months and now I'm having a horrendous week and that's seen as a setback, you know. So again, it's to offer that reassurance that this is very much part of the grieving process that, We are ambushed by grief and there doesn't actually have to be a reason. It doesn't have to be an anniversary or music, Mm -hmm. music. you know, it can be, there may be no clear or visible reason for that, but just to be, to be good to yourself and to be kind to yourself. And it's kind of mentioned there already, not to underestimate our own resilience. That's really important. Mm -hmm. Those really are good tips of, of, yeah, of being gentle I mean, and patient go on more sorry just on that that point about um you know that comes up a lot with us from parents about say uh, a child when they're maybe about eight or nine but the death has occurred when they were a baby and when they were two or three and suddenly now at eight or nine they're starting to express lots of emotions about the loss they're starting to ask lots of questions about the loved one they're getting upset and saying they're missing them and often that really shakes parents because they think oh my god they've they've regressed this there you know there's some problem in their grief but actually for children that's a really normal thing to happen because all that's happening is that what they couldn't understand express or feel when they were two or three when the death happened they're now old enough for to understand that a little bit and to have questions and thoughts and to feel it emotionally. So it's almost like they're grieving for the first time at that level mm. because they're understanding it for the first time at that level. So again, just to reassure parents that, you know, it, throughout a child's life, these things will emerge and these emotions will emerge in different ways. It doesn't mean the child is stuck in their grief it just means they're it's a normal progression for them in their development of how they're learning to understand it and and grow with it as well mm-hmm. and in, indeed as Catherine said in her presentation that can happen in adults in adults which, yeah, yeah that you, you actually only begin to process a loss and um, many years after and that again how frightening and disorienting that can be so mm-hmm. get some help in understanding it Mm. that's that's mm. important and maybe in terms of the bad day a little structure on the day like Rita was saying mm. and Jackie a bit of structure mm. but also lean into the things that really nourish you 
it might be that you need to get out and you mightn't feel like it, but get out and go for a walk. If there's a green space, if you live by the sea, if you live near an, a lake, you know, if someone's invited you for a cup of coffee over the wall, you know, a neighbor that you know is a good, safe person, um, that'll be a nice presence with you that won't be intrusive or anything. Say yes, you know, little baby steps, any yeah. one little action can shift um, a bad day. A yeah. little action. Even an, a nice hot shower. And even Sometimes. a nice hot yeah. shower, you know, the lovely, mm. you know, the snuggly. Yeah, like, just be nice. Clothes. Look, but one little step, you know, that a little action to, to shake small up the piece of yeah, comfort. A little small piece yeah. of comfort. Lean into the comfort somewhere. Yeah. But don't isolate too much. Rita? Just, I suppose, what we're, we're talking about, I'm just coming, rethinking it a little bit. You know, sometimes when you, you'd have a call or you, you really have to listen to them as well, that sometimes they're having maybe more than just a bad day, that it's kind of, that they are maybe a little bit, um, they're at a different level. So I suppose it's important to keep that at the back of your mind as well and kind of maybe explore that a little bit more with them. And while we're encouraging them to do all those things that can turn the day around, if you have a sense that somebody is really not able to turn the day around, I think it is important to keep that at the back of your mind and explore that so that we can signpost them appropriately. And maybe so at the point when they need to see the doctor or need to talk to somebody actually mm -hmm. close to them and get that little extra bit of help. Yeah. So, you know, that's, I suppose it's, it's the spectrum of Absolutely. it. Isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. So we encourage people to do the small bits, get up in the morning and um, nurture yourself, take the baby steps. But if you're not doing that and you can't do that, you're stuck, you're needing something else. So reach out. I think it's really important advice, Rita. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to go on to the next question, because in a way, um, it was striking that this came up a number of times where, where people were wondering about really difficult emotions, like maybe being guilty about not having said something or how they maybe treated somebody who died or having regrets about what they didn't do. Um, so have you any advice for people who are grappling with guilt or regrets? And I think, go ahead, Jackie, yeah. I, 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 again, that is something that, you know, we, we would often hear. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of callers, a lot of us who have been bereaved are left with questions. Yeah. Could I, uh, you know, could I have done more? Should I have done more? And it's very often in having the conversation uh, that, you know, they can hear themselves and, and, and hear their experiences and hear that, you know, they did the best they could, you know, I mean, that's, that's really, really important. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that, you know, sometimes, you know, things have happened that are painful and difficult. Sometimes things have been said that are deeply regretful you know that's real as well we're all human mm -hmm. sometimes relationships are strained uh, or were extremely strained it's important to uh, i think to say that um and yet the grief of course is there just the same mm -hmm. uh grief of you know what might have been regret and so on so i think compassion i think is really important there self-compassion is really really important there yeah yeah it's so right yeah because mm. somebody on the end of a line can't fix this we're, we're not asking you know to to yeah. rewrite history i think you're very you're very mm. right and relationships are complex mm. and sometimes it's kind of checking in with them where they they have an idea that things weren't as good but uh, as jackie said in, in them telling the story you're nearly reality checking with them and mm. And getting to say, well, you know, maybe what they think was a big deal in the context wasn't. Yeah. Um, and then again, it's, you know, some people are more open to it than others. But, you know, Catherine, we talked about the continuing bonds, the ongoing relationship. You know, there is a lot to be said for kind of having that conversation with a person who's passed or writing to them or whatever works for somebody and, and acknowledging your regret if there is something and in some way trying to do something. I think we, 
you know, we talk about men being the doers and the grief, but we all feel that if, if we can do something to bring us closer to kind of um, accepting or, or just kind of getting on with our grief, if there is something practical we can do, and it might be having that conversation um, with the person who's passed, writing the note or whatever it is. And, and you, you get a sense of people when you're talking to them, whether they're open to, to suggesting mm -hmm. something like that or not. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of symbolism that you can encourage the person to use to sort of help them in their grief as well. Absolutely. And, that, and again, that's lovely, the idea of reaching out. A person could get ideas on how to cope. So we're linking back to the previous question about tips. And this is the first time they've been through this journey. Whereas, you know, you've all listened to others, you've trained and you at least have maybe just some ideas to help them explore things a bit further. Thank you. Catherine, Maura, any additions on, on, on that? The only thing I would say is I think, you know, many Irish women and maybe we could all count ourselves as sometimes being very hard on ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. maybe maybe it's an Irish thing. So some of that shoulds and could have, you know, it's so common. You know, I'm thinking of my poor grandmother. I could have and I should have. And, and her grand, my grandfather was a functioning alcoholic. You know, she had a hard life. But I remember as a child hearing her, you know, I should have and I could have. And even then it rang, yeah. you know. You know, there was a clanging sound because you thought, what? You know, so I think mm. we're very hard on ourselves. So I, that lovely word that Jackie used is to soften. And sometimes in talking to somebody and just hearing yourself beating yourself up about you should have and you could have. And if you know that's a pattern that you have, just soften. Even the word, if you just take mm. away that word with you, just soften. But go easy on yourself. You know, we do the best. As, as Jackie says, you do the best you can. And relationships are complicated. <laughs> And people no. aren't saints, you know. No. No. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I suppose my contribution is not in relation to the what I've been talking about about children. It's more from a personal perspective that I know that um, when uh, my dad died during COVID and we couldn't see him at the end, we couldn't be with him. He was in the hospital. We couldn't access, we couldn't be there with him. And, we, and that was really, really, really tough for us because we were always together. Like we were always doing things together. And it took a long time, like I would say years um, to to stop focusing on that last few weeks. Yeah. Um, we all, like we were all obsessed with the fact that we, couldn't be with him for the last few weeks and it's really only I don't know at what point it changed but it's really only more recently certainly in the last eight to ten months maybe mm. that we're all more focusing on all the time we did spend together during his 91 years as opposed to that last three weeks or four weeks you know what I mean mm -hmm. um but I think when when you've been very upset when you've had a difficult time you do it's mm. human nature you mm. focus on the immediacy of what has just mm. happened and I think that happens with families who've talked to me about suicide deaths mm. very difficult to move away from how they died mm. rather than how they lived Absolutely. um and it does take some time mm. and it mm. takes some thinking and some movement and sometimes you need a little bit of help to talk to somebody exactly. to help you move to that point where you can mm. let go of how they died rather than how they lived and 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 that so I just Maura thank you for that on a number of fronts um but on a, a very big one um that you know grief is personal and mm. that all the people here who've been talking maybe you know professionally or talking about how to help bereave people are also bereaved people and we carry our losses with us and we we learn about it by being in it mm. um, and and thank you for sharing that um, and actually at an opportune time when we're coming actually to the end of our our panel um, and I really would love to thank you Rita and Jackie for all your your wisdom and for just showing how a simple phone line um, can help a person really unpack maybe some of what's happening for them and to have that witnessed and heard. Um, and then some advice as well. So thank you both. And thank you so much, Catherine and Maura, for your talks earlier. And indeed to Amanda, 
and to Kieran um, for, for their talks and contributions. Um, we are, as I said, coming close to the end. Um, I really would like to thank again Fanagans for, for their support, allowing us to host these type of events. I think that they, they, they really are important occasions. Um, and then you'll hear, have heard <laughs> me talk about Dervla, our um, director behind the scenes. And Dervla, um, together with Amanda, has really um, directed the whole show, not just the optics this evening, but all of the organisation. So thank you very much, um, Dervla. We're wanting to end with, with a poem. Um, and Rita mentioned symbolism. You know, and I think um, poetry is a, is a very good way, something sometimes of exploring um, what might be going on for us without coming at it directly. So I'm delighted to introduce to you Dominic Campbell. Dominic is also a colleague from Irish Hospice Foundation. Dominic will read the poem and then what will happen is Dervla behind the scenes is going to put up um, some slides um, and the rest of us will, will disappear. The slides will go on for a few minutes um, as people leave the Zoom meeting. And I'll remind you that everything that you've seen and heard today will get emailed on to you. So thank you very much for being here. And I hope that you can find some way of nurturing yourselves. Dominic, over to you with thanks. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, everybody, for this evening. Um, poets have the ability to find words when maybe we don't have any of our own. And this is by Brendan Kennelly. It comes from the end of a book of poetry that the Hospice Foundation put together. Begin again to the summoning birds, to the sight of the light at the window. Begin to the roar of morning traffic all along Pembroke Road. Every beginning is a promise born in light and dying in dark, determination and exaltation of springtime, flowering the way to work. Begin to the pageant of queuing girls, to the arrogant loneliness of swans in the canal, to bridges linking the past and future, to old friends passing through us with us still. Begin to the loneliness that cannot end, since it perhaps is what makes us begin. Begin to wonder at unknown faces, at crying birds in the sudden rain, at branches stark in the willing sunlight, at seagulls foraging for bread, at couples sharing a sunny secret alone together while making good. Though we live in a world that dreams of ending, that always seems about to give in, Something that will not acknowledge conclusion insists that we forever begin. to come.
to come. 